Video number two. <laughs> There's a fucking turkey down here, dude. I hope that's showing up on video. What the fuck? Dude, no, no, bird. <laughs> Do not cross the road. Wow. Gobble, gobble. Okay, that was strange. I wonder if that, okay, sorry. I have to stop filming this so that I can see if that got picked up on camera. Okay, well, anyway, uh, thank you everyone so much. I was so nervous about posting the video and I'm very, very, very nervous about the videos I'm going to be posting. <laughs> I'm actually so nervous about them that I'm going to record this one as a kind of buffer Without further ado, I would like to tell you a story about uh, a guy named Carl, uh, I'm talking about Jung in an annoying way, uh, who had a very strange experience between the years of 1913 and basically like 1916, I think. Um, well, Jung is the, the guy who coined the term synchronicity, but he didn't like invent the idea. You know, the idea of correspondence sympathetic magic, the Tao, things like this are all basically the kinds of ideas that Jung ties together under the idea of synchronicity. Um, synchronicity is like messages radiating from the unconscious. What the unconscious is, is a big mystery. Um, I'll have a little bit more, more to say about it. There, there are some sort of avenues to think about, but but the point of it is that it's unconscious. <laughs> so synchronicity is something that's noticed, but you don't know how it's possible that you can notice it, and you don't know why you've noticed it, and maybe you don't know what it means, but it has a numinous quality to it. So certain people are susceptible to the numinous properties of numbers, for instance. I think all human beings are to some extent, and I have a little argument about why that is. Um, um, but like the number 13, for instance, very many people have strange superstitious feelings about 13. Um, for a lot of people, if you see repetitive digits on a clock, that feels funny. You know, you see 222 or 333. 11 is a really, seems to be a rising, um, what we call it exactly, an image, really. Well, so I've, I've already spilled the beans a little bit. I might as well just give my little, my little toy theory about this. I think people notice these numbers because they replicate little pictures. Uh, 13 is like a column and a s snake. You know, the three is like this coiled serpent form. Well, that's like a Kundalini chakra kind of image or like a caduceus, which is an archetypal image. So I think that the more proximate the visual properties of the number to primordial images, <laughs> the more numinosity we experience when we look at them. So yeah, 13 is very predictable. Um, 333 is very predictable. It's three snakes. It's a very archetypal image. Uh, 666. It's like three spirals. Again, a spiral is a very ancient symbol, and a symbol that um, the unconscious makes use of in dreams and spontaneous fantasies and things like this. Well, so... The thing about synchronicity is that it might begin by noticing a few simple, simple numinous contents, but you very quickly realize that those numinous contents are being stringed together in a way that ends up resembling language. There's like weird statements that are made often. Things happen at strange moments together that seem charged with meaning somehow, symbolic meaning, uh, things of this sort. And if you pull on that stuff a little bit, maybe, or if you, or in my case, it was a little bit more like, well, actually, I'm not so sure, really, if I um, asked for this experience exactly, or if I just found a way to cope with it once it started happening. Um, but synchronicity will lead you into what Jung called a confrontation with the unconscious. And he talked about that under the umbrella of something called the individuation process which is the process of becoming psychologically whole through the process of integrating unconscious contents. This is all really, really dry and sort of dumb. It was really a way for Jung to present what he'd learned from his visionary experience to a world that was just not ready to hear it in the correct way. 
Um, because Jung was a doctor who was also a visionary. And so that equals shaman, actually. <laughs> but, uh, but you can't be a shaman, uh, you know, or you couldn't anyway. Um, well, I, I probably are less able to do it today, maybe. I think in Jung's day, this stuff was, at least Sonu Shamdasani in his introduction to the Red Book suggests that the Red Book was considered much less unusual then. Um, but in any case, even if it was less unusual, I think it was still a major no-no. So, so Jung systematized and constructed these things that he presented as kind of these models, you know, these theoretical models, which is very useful, by the way. I'm not suggesting that that was like labor in vain, but it, but it did allow him to hide. And so, the visionary experiences that Jung had during his confrontation with the unconscious are things that he put down in journals um, called the Black Books, which aren't published yet, but are going to be pub published very soon. Uh, and then also in his, by then, quasi-mythologized uh, already account of his experiences in something called the Red Book. And the thing about the Red Book is that it is just an immense work of art. It's like an illuminated manuscript with these paintings that Jung did. These incredible paintings, and then like pages and pages of his hand-rendered, you know, German calligraphy. Like, it's unbelievable. And that's just at the aesthetic level, to say nothing of the content. Because what the Red Book actually is, is a travel guide <laughs> uh, or maybe not that exactly although it's a little it's definitely that but yeah it's a record it's an account of Jung's journey uh, into the unconscious which is a polite way of saying into the dead world which is what I want to say because I'm interested in pushing this button a little bit we do not appreciate the depth of the unconscious still in the West. We have not learned this lesson yet. Um, it's very deep. <laughs> so deep that it, it seems to collapse into something non-local at the bottom. And synchronicity is at the center of that mystery, I think. And the writing of the Red Book and other things to do with Jung's biography involve that kind of stuff. Jung is a guy who thought that he had precognitively um, foreseen the coming of World War I. That's actually what motivated Jung to formulate the theory of the collective unconscious. It was a direct experience of precognition. It wasn't a, th a theoretical thing. Um, now, who knows what we think about that, of course. Did Jung actually see the future? Did he have a really weird dream that he overread and connected to some, you know, some combination? <laughs> Either, you know, neither, who knows. Um, but he was someone who believed that he had had that experience. Uh, and someone who went on this intense introspective quest in his head in which revelatory contents of some sort were delivered that he then set forth in this book, which is incomplete, by the way. He never finished the Red Book. It just kind of breaks off mid-sentence on page 191 with the word possibility dot dot dot, which <laughs> is maybe the best ending the book could possibly have, um, even though it's not a real ending. But what I'm struck by in all of this is that this incredible document, you know, whatever we end up thinking about it, I relate to it really as, yeah, as like a field notes from the other side or something, along with many other such things, you know, I would count most dreams and myths and mini movies and all kinds of more or less spontaneous products of the imagination um, in that same zone although I do think there's maybe also something special about the Red Book but anyway as I was saying what I'm struck by in all of this is that this amazing work of art uh, what remained unpublished for almost a century you know it was just released ten years ago and although this has not been exactly said directly, I think it's pretty clear that the reason the Red Book remained unpublished for so long was that Jung's estate 
was very afraid that it would make Jung seem crazy <laughs> and thereby, you know, invalidate his entire legacy or something. And so, okay, here's where I have to say something really embarrassing that I don't want to say, which is that whatever happened to Jung pretty much happened to me. I, when I read the Red Book, I did not read it with shock and confusion. It was a life raft. I recognized my experience in it, and it told me that I didn't have to be crazy in a hard way that would mean the end of my life. Because if I was crazy, I guess I was crazy in the same way that Jung was crazy. And it seemed to work out okay for him, at least at the level of kind of returning to some normalcy eventually. So it gave me permission a little bit to sit with the experiences. But so yeah, I'm here to rep for the visionary tradition <laughs> and for the confrontation for confrontations with the unconscious generally speaking which typically culminate in sort of visionary sorts of output but don't necessarily they could just culminate in a psychosis that you get stuck in um, that's sort of the, the model here it's not that people have a disease in their head that that then you imagine maybe you can catch um, no one would admit to thinking that way anymore, of course, but I think people still kind of have that attitude. People are worried that they're going to catch crazy. Um, and so because of that, there's just a whole lot of projective fear surrounding the topic. The issue is really, are you taking a journey through it in a vision questy way, which is always a healing thing? I had to... F I had to go on an underworld journey because that's the degree of fucked that I was. That's really what it comes down to, I think. I, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy or whatever was not going to, you know, those types of things were not going to help me. Not to thumbs down those things. They're very sensible and work for very many people. But for me, there was a deeper problem. And uh, it had to be accessed in symbol space, in shamanic space. Uh, and so I didn't know that. So the, my unconscious found a way <laughs> to produce it. Um, and the way that it reached me was through displays, actually. It was through screens. It was a very strange thing. Um, something new is happening with our relationship to media technology, and it involves the unconscious. So I'm very excited to talk about all that. Um, but anyway, sorry, this becomes a huge ramble. That's the other thing, is it's very difficult to talk about this stuff because it's a big spiral form all the time. Um, Jung had this, used the term circumambulation, to talk about that. Um, so anyway, I am just not interested really in pretending like this didn't happen to me anymore, you know? It happened, whatever it is. Um, if it was me having a psychotic break, then that's what it was. Uh, if it was me <laughs> receiving information from some transpersonal domain, then that's what that was. Uh, if it was something else, or both, or... And, you know, the point is, it doesn't really matter. I perceive these things, and these I've had these experiences, and I don't think anything good can come from disguising them. I think that I want to offer my experience just in whatever way it's useful to anybody. Um, you know, I'm not so sure about all these things in the end. Of course, I can't be. Experience is very fallible. Um, the video that I've shot about this stuff already, I know it's going to, you know... It's a video record of a man going through something completely incomprehensible and trying to reckon with it. And that's, to an extent, sort of, you know, we're always in that position relative to the unconscious, but... I guess what I'd like to say is, I hope it's clear from the way I carry myself and the way I'm speaking and all of this, that um, I'm in a very good place. It, it was successful in my case. Uh, I can't believe how good I feel. <laughs> I definitely suffered enough for it. That's the other thing I'd say about the vision quest. It, I'm talking about it in a way to make it sound, to play it up a little bit and make it sound a little mysterious and enticing, because... I'd like people to keep listening to my story. <laughs> uh, and it has all those qualities, but... But it's a fucking... It's a... 
It's gnarly. We're talking about personality transformation. There's no normal way in which that happens. It's just a, it's a trip. So, the Red Book is Jung's document of his trip. Everything that I've done with Sync Century is essentially my documentation of my trip. I'm interested now in just opening the doors to my alchemical laboratory. What I'd like to say is, look, I don't know what the status is of a lot of this stuff in here. It's just things I've perceived and things I've tried to reckon with and um, things I'm now interested in trying to share. It's all just stuff that I had been repressing and that a lot of us repress. That's my view of it. Um, maybe it's not that, maybe it's nonsense that myself and other suggestible individuals make up and then sell themselves on because they need to believe it in some way, you know? Yeah, it could be. Um, well, anyway, the rationale always is there's no reason to look because it's just crazy, i.e. there's no structure in it. It's just disorganized random content. So Jung actually looked. He approached it on a more receptive level and said, I don't know, let's analyze it. Let's think about it. What are in these delusions and hallucinations? And as soon as he looked, he realized it was the same content that he was finding in the dreams and fantasies of all of his he supposedly healthy patients. Uh, I mean, they were his patients, so I would guess they weren't completely healthy. I'm losing light here, so I'm going to move this to another area. Um, they probably were suffering from various neuroses and things like that. Um, but they weren't psychotic, they weren't schizophrenic. These were basically normally functioning people, perceptually. Um, but in their dreams, Jung was finding just the same material <laughs> that he was finding uh, in his, you know, the mental output of his psychotic patients. Uh, so yeah, that really seems to be, in, to my view, quite convincing evidence for this idea that this stuff we consider to be crazy, it's just the background of consciousness. It's what's going on beneath the veneer of, <laughs> well, calling it a veneer is probably being too uncharitable to consciousness. Uh, consciousness is a great and wonderful innovation, but, um, but, but it's surrounded by the unconscious on all sides. That's probably enough about all of that. Um, that's just, that, so that was my huge awkward prepar preparation to talk to you about my automatic drawing experiences which marked the beginning of my confrontation with the unconscious. Um, yeah. A figure that I identify with the anima uh, <laughs> helped me draw a lot of pictures. We'll, we'll get into more about that and maybe how that works. The next time I can convince myself to sit down in front of this thing and dump my guts into this webcam. God, uh, okay. I would like to now close this just with a prayer for... Uh, <laughs> Patience and compassion for, for anybody watching this. Um, it is really scary to talk about stuff like this, at least for me. Um, I do really imagine that people are going to be worried about me or something. I, I just really want to emphasize that I'm fine, and we're all fine, actually. I mean, some of us are, of course, not well. Um, I wasn't well. I think I was in the middle of kind of trying to ramble through some attempt to describe how much this thing has healed me, whatever it is. Um, sync and the underworld journey really do have the potential to put you back together in a, in a better way. At least it did for me. And I don't know what would have happened if in the early stages of this experience I had gone in and shared stuff with like a mental health professional. I rather expect they would have classified a lot of it as delusions of reference and probably pumped me full of drugs. That probably, maybe that would have been okay, maybe it wouldn't have. Um, it just strikes me that that isn't necessarily the best way to handle <laughs> entire, sorry, now I am going to start sounding a little annoyed or something, but in, in entire zones of human experience, say spirituality, that we just pathologize in the West because we're very terrified of it, because we repress it very strongly, uh, because we've had very rotten experiences with it. I understand all this, you know, there, or I don't know if I understand all of it. <laughs> I probably understand very little of it, but I, I understand the basic sort of historical um, 
justifications for that. Yeah, Christianity turned into a really rotten, awful thing. Um, and many religions have been used in very awful ways and so on. Well, so have very many political ideologies, though, you know? I think it's a little weird to single out certain things that ended in terrible ways <laughs> and not other things. I don't know. Um, really, I just want to say that We all need to learn to make a little bit more space for how different our baseline perceptions of reality can be. They can be really different. A lot of what I want to talk about is the power of belief systems and the degree to which they both produce and, you know, filter out material. <laughs> um, probably talk about that stuff next time. But uh, it just seems to me that as long as people are behaving in a way that's basically conformant with our expectations and civilization, i.e., you're not harassing people, raving in the streets, or you're not, you know, violently attacking people, you're not... Um, you know, essentially you're not a danger to yourself or others, then I think really all bets are off and people just need to get a little bit more comfortable with... Yeah, with, with the diversity of our perceptual systems. I consider myself to be a neuroatypical person. Um, that's a term that usually means autism. I don't... Sometimes I think I'm a little bit on the spectrum or something. I don't think that really makes sense in my case. But I definitely am wired in a funny way. And I've had outlier, weird perceptual experiences my entire life. And I hate that I feel like I have to be ashamed of them in some way or kind of apologize for them. I know that's pro probably a lot in my head, but I think it's in my head because it's been culturally reinforced a ton. So, we exist in a different world here, moving into 2020. We have this thing called the internet. <laughs> and we don't have to let uh, the consensus reality dictate the conversation anymore. The weirdos are here, we've always been here, and there's really no reason for me to re remain silent because it's not like I'm gonna lose a job or like my girlfriend's gonna dump me or, you know. <laughs> That's all already happened, so. The only thing that was preventing me from doing this was just my own fear of judgment and my own continued ego about it. Because it doesn't really matter, of course, in the end what people think about me. Um, I just don't want to let these experiences vanish into thin air. I, I think in the end they're worth something, even if they're just a cautionary tale. So that's up to everybody to decide, of course. I would just ask you to please be gentle with me when voicing those concerns, if you can. Um, it's, it has been a long and difficult road, and although I am feeling spectacular and ready to begin the next chapter of my life with enthusiasm and energy, I also am still a bit raw and touchy about, yeah, about this whole issue. I mean, essentially what's happened, just to give the high-level summary, is I am no longer operating within the confines of the Western rationalist tradition. I just think it doesn't work. It leaves too much unaccounted for. I see a world around me that is brimming with magic. I mean, just everywhere. Now maybe that's because my perception is broken. <laughs> it's such a way that it tricks me into thinking there's magic everywhere. Um, or maybe magic is happening in a way that's just a little subtle and requires a little bit of an adjustment to perceive. Well, that's what Jung thought. That's what I think. Of course, I guess I would because that's the way that I get to feel the, the least internally nuts about my own views and my own situation, you know. I think I was trying to say this in the intro and then that weird turkey or whatever it was that ran by uh, distracted me. Um, what I was trying to say was just how touched I am and how grateful I am for all of the amazing, supportive, 
inc just incredible things people have said to me over the last 48 hours. Uh, I feel very loved and very lucky to know all of you. So, thank you very much. And, uh, yeah. Well, it's really starting to get dark out here. So I guess I should go inside and bundle up and watch Kitchen Nightmares <laughs> or whatever it is I'm going to use to um, anesthetize myself at the end of this somewhat lengthy and packed day today. So, all right. Thanks, everybody, for hanging, and uh, talk to you later. Bye.